rarely change my mind. I've changed my mind, and so we're going to do that still, but we're going to just offset it a little bit. I'm going to do something in between that um, I, I just found to be very relevant, necessary for our particular time, and it is kind of the necessary outworking of talking about where our Bible came from. And so I, uh, we're going to talk about tonight hermeneutics. And if I, if I were to ask you to write a definition of the word hermeneutics, uh, would you be able to do it? Just out of curiosity, is, is hermeneutics something you know what it is? Kind of. Some say kind of, some say not at all. Okay, well, good, right? Uh, in a sense, good, because that's why I found it necessary, because when I start talking about what hermeneutics is, you're going to say, oh, okay, well, yeah, I do know about that concept. Maybe you just didn't know the particular word. Okay, then that's okay. So I'm going to start tonight just by giving you a simple definition of the word hermeneutics. And a simple definition... Um, uh, no, I'm not. Never mind. Let's go by my slides, Jimmy. Okay? I'm not going to throw you for, for, a, for a loop like that. Okay. Let me ask this question first. Then we'll get to my definition. What is the Bible? What is the Bible? We were talking about where did our Bible come from previously, right? Where, how did we get the Bible? Where did it come from? What, now we're asking, what is the Bible? Now that we have it, okay, great. We've, okay, we've got this thing in front of us. What is it? Is it, is it historical? Or, or is it mythical? Because we know about myths. Or is it a mystical cultic collection? You know, like uh, the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Is it filled with incantations? You know, what, what, what is this thing exactly? Does it represent reality? Or is it a story? Is it fiction? Did, is it human or is it divine? Because it's claimed to be divine. But clearly it was written by people. Okay, so when we ask what is the Bible, these, these are the types of questions that we're asking. And it's important that we ask these questions in order to arrive at an answer. Okay, next, after we answer that, okay, we, we kind of come to an answer to that. How is the Bible then, depending on what it is, how is it to be understood? Is it true or is it not true in the things that it claims? Is it relevant? Is it literal or is it allegorical? Because it can be true whether it's literal or whether it's allegorical, but nevertheless true. So it's two different questions, right? Uh, what, what is this thing? So let me give you uh, a couple examples. Here's how we could uh, look at particular stories. The creation account, for example. Okay, the creation account in the book of Genesis. Did it actually occur in history? If so, why does it matter? And if not, what is its purpose? But do you see how me asking the creation account, did it occur in history? Well, if it's a myth, then no, it, it didn't. But it still serves a purpose. It's, never the, it's, it's still true. It's just a way of seeing things. Or we might say, no, it's literally true. What it says is actually how it happened. Okay, all right. What way do we see that? How is the Bible to be understood? This is the big question. Okay, next, think about the story of Jonah, for example. The story of Jonah, did it occur in history? A guy was really swallowed by a fish. I mean, really? You still stick to that story? Like that really happened? Did it occur in history? Do you know that even in the world of seminary, do you know most seminaries now don't teach that it was actually historically a real account of a man being swallowed by a fish? Do you know that? No, they, they lump it into a category called myth. And it's like, okay, it's true, and they're trying to get a point across, though. It wasn't actually a real story about a real man it was just a story to prove a point to show how God works in history. Okay. How about this? The resurrection of Jesus. Did it occur in history? 
If so, why does it matter? If not, what is its purpose? Are there some who claim that the resurrection did not actually occur in history, but yet they still look to the Bible for a certain amount of relevance? You know, I mean, it's okay. The Bible has good things to say. Now, the resurrection didn't happen, but, you know, still a good book to, you know, look at, glean some things about these historical people that clearly had ideas about what was right and wrong. They got something right, so let's see what they have to say. When we look at the Bible, we are asking questions of interpretation. What does all this mean and how are we to interpret it? Is it true? Is it not true? Is it some kind of myth? Is it an allegory? Is it, I mean, what are we looking at here? And when we start to ask these types of questions, this, these are questions concerning hermeneutics. Okay? Simple definition of hermeneutics. The hermeneutics is the art and science of biblical interpretation. Hermeneutics is the art and science of biblical interpretation. Hermeneutics is kind of a funny word. One of my very first classes I ever took in Bible college, my undergraduate, was hermeneutics. I had never heard the word before in my life, but I knew I had a class titled hermeneutics. <laughs> I had no idea what it was. I had no idea what it was going into it either. Uh, because it's a word that, I don't know, we don't really use. Now, I will say, hermeneutics is interpretation of any text. In any, it doesn't have to be the Bible. Okay? Um, for example, you use hermeneutics to interpret the Constitution. Right? But, do you know, there are two different ways. Uh, well, there's more than two different ways. But you can see two essentially different ways that the Constitution is interpreted. Right? You have a conservative interpretation, a liberal interpretation. And you might say, well, how did two different groups of people reading the same document come up to two separate conclusions, both saying, I got it from that? Right. Because they're interpreting it with different lenses or a different set of rules. Right? Okay, so it's, it's the same with the Bible, but we believe there to be a proper set of rules. And if you don't use this proper set of rules, which is the science then you can't possibly be arriving at a proper interpretation of what it says. But it's not only about rules of interpretation, it's also about an art. Because we can get what it says, but then actually grasping the idea and then also being able to communicate what you're reading is an art form that has to be practiced. Have you noticed that understanding your Bible actually becomes a little easier with practice? How can that be? It's not just because I'm learning the rules better, which that sometimes is the case, but it's also literally about practicing. I'm becoming better at this art form of interpretation, which adheres to particular rules, which is the science part. So it comes from the Greek word hermeneuo. That's so, but we say hermeneutics. It's a transliteration. Um, it means to explain or to interpret, to translate. Some people think it comes from the Greek god Hermes. It kind of sounds like hermeneutics, right? Hermes. What was Hermes' job? Anybody remember? Hermes was the mouthpiece of the gods. He was the messenger of the gods. And so he would take a message from the gods and interpret it or translate it for the people. And so some people think that's where the, the word came from, but it's actually in our Bible, this word translate. Like, for example, when Jesus says something in Aramaic and it says, which translates to? It's his hermeneo, to translate or to interpret. So hermeneutics is the art and science of biblical interpretation. What is this? How is this connected with the ideas that we've just looked at previously? It's connected this way. Textual criticism seeks to know what the original words are, right? Isn't that what we just talked about a lot? What were the original words? That's textual criticism. What is hermeneutics? Hermeneutics wants to know what those words mean. Okay, great. We have the words. Okay. Now, now what? Now what do we do with those words? What good are the words if we don't interpret them? Right? And so you see the connection. Why might there be so much fuss about biblical interpretation? It's because we have interpretive hurdles such as 
history. Is history a hurdle for interpretation? Yeah. How long ago was the New Testament written? Roughly. About 2,000 years ago. Would you say history is, I mean, things have changed in 2,000 years? And so do we have a gap, a hurdle to jump to say, they wrote it 2,000 years ago. What would this stuff have meant 2,000 years ago? That's a hurdle, right? How can you understand something if you don't jump the hurdle to get to interpret it? You can't. What about culture? Has culture changed in the past 2,000 years? And by the way, this is just the New Testament. So if we're talking Old Testament, we'll go back even farther. An additional 2,000 years. Has culture changed in the past two to 4,000 years? So something was written in a way that was understood by a culture two to 4,000 years ago? If we don't jump the hurdle, somehow, how can we properly interpret it? What about language? Is there a language barrier, hurdle? Yeah, we talked a lot about that already, didn't we, in the past several weeks? philosophy, uh, generally speaking, just the worldview, the way they viewed the world was different. And that's a hurdle. We have to get into their mindset. How did they, what did this mean to them? Okay, so a question here then is, why is this study necessary? I think at least three reasons. One, to protect us from error. Two, to help in personal Bible study. And then number three is confidence in God's word. What does this mean? How many people have ever read the Bible and said, what does that mean? And then followed by a throw up the hands, turn the page. I don't know. Moving on. (laughs) I remember doing a lot of that when I first started reading the Bible. Uh, What does this mean? I don't know. Uh, I'm not even close to trying to get him to figure it out. So I'm just moving right along. Uh, And wouldn't it be nice to have more confidence in God's word? Uh, You know what? Uh, There is a way to understand what this says. It's not meant to be cryptic in something that is in a sense that you, what does this mean? And it's, I can't wrap my brain around it now. In application, sometimes we might be searching for God, how am I to apply this truth to my life? And there is a role of the Spirit in application, but not only that, not not only a role of the Spirit in application, but in interpretation. But I'll ask you the question and tell me what you think about this. Can a, someone who is not a Christian understand in its basic sense the words of scripture, what it's saying. Is it possible that an unbeliever could understand the words of the Bible in what it's saying to us better than a Christian? I would say without a doubt. The, what's actually being communicated by the author, here is what Paul meant when he said this. Okay, we can figure that out. Rules of interpretation. But now, can an unbeliever take that truth and what has been said is appropriate it to their life? Truly grasp a concept so as to apply it to their life in a way that God had intended through that truth? The answer to that is no. That is a work of the Spirit in our lives. Some circles say that you don't need any external help to understand the Bible, that you read the Bible and God is going to mystically, magically, just tell you what it means. He is going to interpret it for you and that's what the Spirit is supposed to do. Right? Have you ever heard anything like that? Oh, just read it and God is going to just, somehow he's going to dump you know, 2,000 years of history, cultural context, you know, philosophical understanding of the way they wrote, and like all that is just going to be dumped in your lap. I mean, think about reading, for example, um, uh, lists of names. 
or list of cities that require geographical context, right? I, okay, I, I don't know how I'm supposed to understand that. Look at a map. Does God use secondary means to teach us? Sure. That's why almost all of your Bibles are going to have maps in the back <coughs> to help you at least have a grasp of where this place is that we're even talking about and why it might be significant. But how applicable is a study like this really? And how important is it really? Because I have a study Bible and it has notes at the bottom. Uh, I can just Google search anything I want. So it's just what does it matter really? I'll let other people tell me what the Bible means. That is the culture we live in. Is that anything you want to know about anything, you Google search it, and you look at one or two different options, and you pick the one that sounds best to you. Right? This is true with many, many, many things. It is true also in the world of theology. And it's sad. And uh, it is not what we are called to. Um, so here's what I did. I, I wanted to know, is hermeneutics being, number one, used in churches, and is it being taught to congregations? This is what I wanted to know because and I didn't want to know generally because generally I could give the answer of probably not. I mean, that's kind of what you're all thinking right now. Probably not. Um, but can we verify that? So what I did was I, I researched the largest churches in the United States as of last year. And I looked at the top six churches and I listened to all of their most recent sermons. Each of those churches, I listened to the, um, their sermon from Sunday, the entire thing. And so what I'm going to do over the next just couple of minutes is I'm going to tell you about these sermons. Church number one, North Point Community Church, Pastor Andy Stanley, attendance 40,000 every week. Largest church in the United States. See, we already beat Andy Stanley up quite a bit, and so I don't think I need to labor this one too much because what is, that, what is he famous for right now in this, in this moment, these last couple of years? Unhitching the Old Testament. Yeah. He says, uh, for the Bible tells me so, it doesn't work anymore. He proved that to be true in his sermon, actually, um, because he didn't mention scripture until the very, very, very end and said, I want to close with one verse today. He went the entire sermon to the last couple of minutes and said, I want to close with a verse today. Now, what I could do in this moment is overemphasize something to prove a point and leave information out to make you think it's worse than what it really is. I don't need to do that. All I need to do is tell you what it actually is, and it's that bad. He used Philippians 2.5. In your relationships with one another, think the same way as Jesus. That's what he said. And then he said, what was Jesus' mindset? Do you know what he did to say what Jesus' mindset was? Did he look at the context of Philippians 2.5, you think? No, he went to Luke 5.31 and talked about the 99 and the 1. Jesus' mindset was to search after the 1 when the 99 were doing just fine. That's the mindset of Jesus that we all need to have. And why did he do that? Well, to prove his cute little point for his sermon series, which is called Reassembly Required. Talking about relationship reconciliation. This is an example of bad hermeneutics because that is not what Philippians 2.5 says. Next church. That's exciting, isn't it? Christ Church of the Valley, Pastor Ashley Woolridge. That's a man. Attendance, 32,000 weekly. 
His sermon was on uh, the busiest day in Jesus' life. On the busiest day in Jesus' life, Jesus got alone with God, and so therefore, in your busiest day, you just need to get alone with God. The reason you don't have solitude is because you don't have a system. And the Bible is our guidebook for life. Other than that, it was just stories and a video clip. What's the passage? Well, it was from Mark 1, the busiest day in Jesus' life. That's the Bible reading. That was the sermon. That's exciting, isn't it? Next, Gateway Church. Pastor Robert Morris, attendance 31,000 weekly. Gateway Church is where Kerry Job is from. He's preaching on the seven churches of Revelation. When God opens an opportunity for you, no one can shut that door. Jesus has given you the keys to the kingdom, and therefore now you can open doors that no one can shut. Pretty good, huh? Mm -hmm. I can open doors that no one can shut as long as I'm praying in agreement with heaven. That was a direct quote. You can open doors that no one... That's inspiring. You put your key, which Jesus gave you. You put your key in that door, and you open that door, nobody can shut it because Jesus gave you the key. To what door? Any door you want. That's exciting. That was the sermon from Gateway Church. Number... Uh, the church of Laodicea. Uh, number four. Southeast Christian Church, Pastor Kyle Edelman. Weekly attendance, 26,000. Now this one I actually have a personal connection with. I went to Southeast Christian Church for a little bit back in my former days because this is in Louisville. I didn't know I didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know that what they were doing. I didn't know anything about their theology. They had a great band. (laughs) That's what I knew. Right? And in and the you know pastor that dressed real cool and you know, hey, that's why I went. Man, the entrance to this place was like an airport. It, you walk in, it had a giant fountain in this uh, entryway and giant fountain like almost the size of this room. Fountain, I mean. Anyway, what was his sermon about? The invisible enemy. Where are your vulnerabilities? The enemy wants to keep you distracted. He wants division. He wants isolation. And then he proceeded to get emotional on stage and cry quite a bit about how distracted and isolated he has felt over the year 2020. And that was the sermon. Okay, next. Number five, Eagle Brook Church. Pastor Jason Strand, weekly attendance, 25,000. This is your moment. Prepare for your moment. And the way to this remarkable life is by taking a thousand unremarkable steps. It's kind of like the book of Esther. This is the scripture. If it's important to you, you'll find a way. And if not, you'll find an excuse. Just like Esther. Now, he didn't read from Esther, but he referenced the story. (coughs) 
Esther could have found an excuse, but she found a way, didn't she? God has placed you where you are for such a time as this. Wouldn't you guess that was coming? And that was the sermon. Are you catching on to something here? Number six, Saddleback Church, Pastor Rick Warren. Weekly attendance, 23,000. Title of the sermon is, How Can I Benefit From My Pain? That's the title of the sermon. How Can I Benefit From My Pain? I'll at least give it to Rick Warren that his sermon had more scripture in it than any of the others. It was just wrongly interpreted. Lives are filled with pain. Pain is a warning light that something is wrong. And then God says, here are five choices you can make. I didn't take all the choices down. I'll give you the first one. Use pain to draw closer to God. Use pain to draw closer to others. Use pain to... Right. Where, where, where's the scripture for this? What has God said about pain? I don't know. Not important. Here's what Rick Warren says about pain. The theme is not in any of these cases. This is my last one. The theme is in, in, in any of these cases, no one asked, what has God said about these things that you're talking about? More importantly, when these pastors went to prepare their sermons, they thought, what would be a good thing for me to talk about on Sunday? I never ask that question. I go to scripture and I see what scripture we're at and I say, what has God said in the scripture and I'm going to communicate it my best to the people because God has something to say. Do you see a big difference between those two concepts? These churches are very influential churches. Their pastors are writing books. Their bands are selling albums. And the songs they're singing, who influenced the theology of those songs? The pastors that are preaching sermons like this. Who hears that music? You do when you turn on the Christian radio station. This is very influential in our lives. Hermeneutics will be said to have been practiced by, I think, each one of those pastors because I really doubt that any of them don't have an education. They know what the word hermeneutics means. I'm going to talk about him, even though he's an easy target. Uh, not so much today, but in, in days to come. I'm going to talk about Stephen Furtick at Elevation Church. But the reason being is because Stephen Furtick knows better. Stephen Furtick graduated with his master's degree from Southern Seminary. He knows what hermeneutics are. He knows his errors. I know that he knows. But that's not getting the people in the seats the way he wants it to. And he's learned that. In fact, the better thing to do is to appeal to something that no one can prove to be either right or wrong. So I want you to think with me as we're, I'm, I'm drawing tonight to, some, to somewhat of a close here because what I'm doing is really introducing this idea and the necessity of it. Um, is that there's something called allegorical interpretation of scripture. And what that looks like is something like this. For example, I'm not, gonna, I'm not great at it. I, I don't want to get good at it, but I'm going to give you an, an example of how you could run with it, okay? I'm going to use probably the most famous one, the story of David and Goliath. Who is Goliath and who is David? Someone give me some answers. Goliath is your problem in life. We are David. Nobody has anything else? 
Okay. So, what does that mean for you? <laughs> oh, boy. <coughs> yeah? <laughs> You're probably right. Someone's used it at some point. Goliath is the opposition of Christians. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anything else? What? Slay your giants. Yeah, slay your giants. Okay. There are two ways to go about this concept. One has merit, the other has no merit whatsoever. The way in which an allegory can have merit is, first of all, if the New Testament tells us that it can be interpreted allegorically, as some passages can be interpreted allegorically, as the New Testament tells us, right? But it seems to be that whenever a passage is interpreted allegorically, it points to, huh? Christ should and does in reality, right? And so the big giant that wanted to crush us is not our problems in life or those people in life that come up against us. But there was a king from the line of David who crushed something that none of us could even touch. And that is Jesus Christ who crushed sin and death, our greatest enemy. Valid allegorical interpretation. The thing about that is, is it's an allegorical interpretation. What if David was David and Goliath was Goliath? What if in the story of David and Goliath, Goliath was Goliath and David was David? Is there warrant for us to say that the Bible is telling us that Goliath are those big things in life that you can accomplish on your own and so therefore you need some help. But don't worry if you're little. You can do it with the power of God. If you keep God first and you just run headstrong after it, you're going to accomplish it by the power of God. Is that what God is telling us in the story of David and Goliath? If you say yes, that's bad hermeneutics because the answer is no, that's not what God is telling us. That's not what God is telling us. But that's what you're being told God is telling us. But that is not what God is saying. But you know what? If I say stuff like that, how can you prove me wrong, really? Another example of this, I was telling uh, Augusta the other day at Karate. We were talking about this a little bit. I've talked to you about the Latter Rain movement. Um... The Latter Rain Movement uh, is in Pentecostalism. And if you don't remember, uh, it, it has to do with the Azusa Street revivals that happened in California, um, which branched off of a Wesleyan holiness movement. Um, and if we're gonna be holy, well, we need the Holy Spirit for holiness, right? Well, that makes sense. But I don't have holiness perfected yet, so therefore I must not have the Spirit perfectly yet. When am I gonna have it? Well, I want that moment to come, and when that moment does come, it's going to be evidenced to the world by means of me doing a lot of crazy things. Speaking in tongues, laying on the ground, screaming, crying, having fits, things of this nature. This happened at the, on the, Azu at the Azusa Street revivals, and then the, it took hold and spread uh, throughout the, uh, through the West, and then up to Canada, and then came down to Florida, and then kind of permeated everywhere uh, from there. And so, but why am I bringing this up? Because obviously to them, there has been an outpouring of the Spirit that started at the Azusa Street Revivals that hasn't been around since, I don't know, Pentecost. And so, 
Someone was reading one day in the Old Testament and they came across the fact that God is faithful in the early rains and the latter rains. And they said, now wait a minute. I like this. To think about it. I got it. Here's what it means. I don't think you're ready for this. You ready? This is actually the kind of language that they'll use because they're withholding power in themselves. They have some, some kind of knowledge that you don't have and you'll never get. God is telling me something you can't. I don't even know if you can be. You, is your spirit ready for what I'm about to tell you? The latter rains are significant to us. But let me tell you what the early rains are. The early rains was when God sent the spirit at Pentecost. And the latter rains oh, they started raining at the Azusa Street revivals and it's still raining today. That's what it meant. That's what that scripture means. Allegorical, hyper-spiritualized interpretation of scripture. That's what it means. That's how I interpret that. It created a whole movement that is still alive today. We can go on. There are lots of movements that begin with someone's allegorical, hyper-spiritualized interpretation of Scripture that has no bearing on reality. What we're going to learn is that God intended to communicate to us through authors who were writing and they had a particular intention in mind and they were using grammar and words that can be understood. And so we use the historical, grammatical hermeneutic that looks at both history and grammar to understand what it is the original author was communicating and then to understand what it is they were communicating. Does this make sense? So is it helpful then to look at history and to look at culture and to look at their mindset and to say, where was this geographically? What was happening at that time? What might this have meant to them? Historical, cultural understanding. And then grammatical understanding. If we don't care about the words they chose, then what do the original languages even mean? Well, what significance are they? We don't care. I don't care what the original said. Because here's what I feel it means. This is what I feel the Bible means. Or what does the Bible mean to you? What does this passage mean to you? You've heard this question. It was really, really popular in the 90s to ask that. What does this mean to you? You've been in a Bible study and someone says, what does this passage mean to you? As if it has more than one meaning. A passage of scripture does not have more than one meaning. Now it has many applications. So you might say, how does this truth apply to you? And that may have been what you meant when you asked that. But we don't say, what does it mean to you? No, here's what it means now. How does it apply? How does this truth apply to you? And so, we are not like other mystical religions that look at some kind of text and we search and we dig for some kind of deeper meaning that's allegorical to the text. Right? That's Joseph Smith type stuff. And worse. Okay, so we're going to look at, over these next few weeks then, the proper way that we interpret Scripture. Now, does, uh, I'll just ask this just for you to think about, does the fact that we are going to learn together how to interpret Scripture, does that diminish the Spirit's work in our life in interpretation? Does that make it unspiritual? You say, man, you're robbing this of all the spiritual goodness that I want to find and read in my Bible. I would argue the exact opposite. This proves to us that God was using the Spirit to communicate through these individuals this text. And we trust in it so much 
that we want to see what God said. We trust in the Spirit's work, not only to understand what he wrote through these people, but we trust that he's gonna give us help and strength and he's going to use this truth to convict our hearts to believe these things to be true and to change us. So, 